Take out your Bibles. We're going to start in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse number 32. One thing that we want as Christians is to see people saved. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Being born again. Saved. And one thing we need to be is effective in reaching people. And I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but there are, are some things you can do and some things you can say which will attract people to you and kind of give you an audience to talk to them and witness to them. And there are also things you can do and say that can drive people away from you. You're going to attract people to yourself, and therefore, you have an opportunity to witness to them. You have an opportunity to say something about the Lord. Or you can behave in certain ways that drive people away from you, that repulse people. Now, this is not going to be a difficult question I'm going to ask right now. And hopefully, everyone has the right answer and the same answer. Which would you like to be? <laughs> One of those that attracts people to yourself? Or ones that drives people away from you. Of course, the first one, I think everyone in this room that has any sense would say, well, I want, the I want to be attractive personality. I want to be able to attract people and have friends and all these things. Well, there's certain things you can do that can help that. But you know something? There's also some things here, qualities that the Lord himself has, and also should be true in our lives, too, that will attract people to him. And that's what he wants. It's the right things. It's the good things. And I want to talk about some of those things this is what's involved in effective evangelism. If you really want to reach somebody, you have to have the right qualities yourself. We had a saying we used to say all the time, and I haven't heard it recently, but I think it's still true. It says, before you can win someone to the Lord, you have to win them to yourself. So you have to have these qualities. These qualities. Now, some of these qualities about the Lord I'm going to bring up you can't have because you're not as great as he is or as powerful as he is. But there's a lot of qualities that we need to have that will attract people to ourselves. That's why the Bible says if he that hath friends must show himself friendly. If you want to have friends, you have to be a friendly type person yourself because you will attract what you are, good or bad. Let's pray as we talk about the qualities of God that draw men. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this interesting thought that I want to bring up. Please help me to preach it well, clearly, and that each Christian here will take these things to heart. And for those that are here that are not yet really born again, I, I pray the Holy Spirit of God will convict them, will give them understanding. So please help me as I preach. May the Lord be honored. May Christians really be revived. May we not be complacent with what we are. But Lord, may we desire to be more spiritual minded and a better witness. And then also for those that are not saved, we pray for their salvation. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. As we preach on the qualities that draw men. John chapter 12, verse 32. It says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw. Now there's our key word tonight, draw. Will attract, a draw will draw all men unto me. So the condition there is in the first part of verse 32. If, that's a little big words in the Bible. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. It talks about that we're drawing men to himself. What will draw people to him? Well, I think the first one is right there in John chapter 12, verse 32, is that people will be drawn to him when they see the reason and the purpose that he died on Calvary's cross. Why did he die there? Now we know it was because he had to pay the price of our sin. And he's the only one that could do it. He had to be punished for our sin in our place. Uh, the substitutionary atonement, we know that. But what kept him there? Because he, he loved people. And so the love of God is the first thing that's very, very attractive. 
something that will draw men, something that will attract men, is the love of God. Now, there's things we can do that will drive people away. We can be bullying. We can be bossing. We can be obnoxious. We can be pushy. We can do all kinds of things like that. And that drives people away. But we want to attract people to ourselves so we have then a, a, an opportunity to witness to somebody. So what I'm asking you tonight to consider is where you are in your character and what you are and how you behave. And are there certain things in your life that attract people and other things in your life that repel people? First, number one, though, the quality that God has that attracts people is the love of God. Jesus Christ died for us on Calvary's cross. And to reach the world, we have to be loving. We have to be loving. Now, we need to understand, too, that love is not just an affection, although that's not bad, too, and that's all right. But most of the time, probably nine times out of ten, when the Bible talks about love, it's not talking about an emotion. It's talking about a quality. Now, we're not going to take the time tonight, but in 1 Corinthians 13 are those qualities. And some of those qualities are forbearing. You just put up with people. Now, you don't have to put up with their good qualities. It's easy to put up with their good qualities. Uh, when people do things right, and they do things that are loving, and they do things that are kind, and they do things that are pleasing, and they do things that make you happy, well, then that's easy. You don't have to put up with that. I mean, that you like. But what do you have to put up with? Their bad qualities. The things that are not easy to get along with. You know, parents, parents love their kids. And that's rightly the way it should be. They love their kids. And they love them when they do right. And it's easier to love them when they do right. But there's times they don't do some things right. But you know something, even though they might do some things wrong and they misbehave, you still love them. Parents still love their kids. They still love their kids, no matter how they might act. They love it. And that's why when there's problems and difficult, it breaks the parents' heart. Because they love those kids. More than they'll ever know, maybe, maybe. But it's the love of God. But love is an attracting quality. Having love for people, being patient with their faults and their quirks, uh, caring about them anyways, being, being nice to them when they don't deserve you to be nice to them, being merciful and gracious to them when they don't deserve it. And we all need that, don't we? We all need that. We all need to be more loving. We need to realize that we need to put up with these people. We need to put up with each other. That's one reason for a church. And that's why there's problems in churches, because people don't act the right way, and they don't have love, and they don't forbear with other Christians and other people's faults in their churches. And so there's problems in churches because of that, because they can't get along with others, because they got a quality they don't like, and they said something about you, and they did something against you. And so you think to yourself, that's it. I've had it with them. I've had it with that church. But where's the love, though? See, the love, the love forbears, puts up with those things. And that's what's needed. Now, if you're waiting for just an ideal world, that's not going to happen until heaven rolls around. In heaven, we'll be without the old nature. In heaven, we will be perfect. But it was in heaven. But that's not going to be true until heaven. Now we've got our quirks. We've got our faults. We've got our things that aggravate us. Uh, in marriages, sometimes the longer you're married to somebody, the more it starts to irk you because they're quality, some of the rough things. And when you're first married, you're, you're just in love. You're a psychological mess is what you are when you first get married. Because you don't see anything. You're, you're just blinded to reality. You're just living on this, this affection, this emotional high. You don't know what's going on. But as time goes on, the emotions change a little bit. It might take a little time, weeks, months, maybe years, but the emotions fluctuate. Now, you ought to keep emotion in a marriage. You should. But number one is love. Love attracts. There's people that we're trying to win to the Lord. They've got some good qualities, and they've got some qualities that would, well, I'll just put this, are hard to deal with. Some qualities are hard to deal with. But does God love them? Did Jesus Christ die for their sins? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the love attracts. Number two, the goodness of God attracts. The goodness of God. The goodness of God leadeth men to repentance, the Bible says. Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. There it is. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. I, I'd encourage you to memorize this verse. It says, Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering." And by the way, forbearance and long-suffering are a couple of those definitions of love in 1 Corinthians 13. 
Then it says, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It uses the word repentance right there. See, it means that when people see how good God is, that's something that'll lead a person to accept Christ, repent of their sins. See, when people see how good God is, as they stood and they saw the Lord Jesus Christ die for our sins, they knew how unfairly he was treated. And yet out of his mouth came nothing vile, nothing rough, uh, no kind of oath at all. He just loved people anyways. As he was dying there in the torment that he was going through, as no man ever did before. But the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. And I got to admit this, the devil has done a good job of convincing people otherwise. They think God's the bad guy. God is not the bad guy. God is the good guy. God is the one that cares about us and loves us. God is the one that he does everything that's right. He always does what's right. He always does what's good. God is good. And you know, as people, they want to criticize God all the time and they want to say, well, why does he allow this? And why does he allow this problem? Our problems are because of our own making. Don't make God the bad guy. Don't say, why didn't God do something? Well, why don't you do something to begin with? Years ago, as tragic as it is, I'm going to use this as an illustration. Uh, there was a family where a couple of their youngsters got out. They went, got drunk. It took some drugs, got in a car accident, and one of them was killed. Now, I get a tragic story, a tragic story. One of the one, other ones from the family asked one of the ladies from our church, they ask you this, he says, why did God allow that? The lady from our church had the right answer. She said, God didn't make him go out and get drunk. God didn't make him go out and take those drugs. God didn't make him go out and drive that car like that and get in that car accident. That was not of the Lord. They have their free will. They can do the things they want to do. God's not only can prevent that because it's not God that caused that accident. It was their own foolish behavior. God always wants for you what's best. He's the one that died. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. How can you criticize that kind of love? How can you criticize that kind of action where Jesus Christ was willing to go through all he did for you? Don't criticize him. Look what he did for you. The goodness of God. Everything God does is good. Everything he does is righteous. Everything he does is good. We need to realize that. And we'll praise the Lord. We'll be happy with him. And when we find that out and we witness to people about these things, how good God is and what he's done for us and what he's provided for us, it will attract people. Because it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And repentance is a prerequisite to salvation. Repent. Believe, and then there's salvation. So God is the good one. The goodness of God will lead people to repent. People sometimes ask, well, can I pray for someone who's not a Christian if they're going through some problem and difficulty? Would God answer that prayer? And the answer to that is absolutely he would. He wants to show his goodness. In fact, when we pray, when we as Christians pray to the Lord, we need to pray. And in a way, if I can use the word, we want to convince God to answer our prayer. That's sort of the, the way it worked. Moses did that in the Old Testament. David's prayers in the book of Psalms. He used arguments and logic to try to convince God to answer this prayer in the right way, in the right way. And one of them is say, Lord, would you just, out of your goodness, to show this person how good you are and how powerful you are, would you answer this prayer for their specific need? Because God is good. God is good the goodness of God, that will draw people. That'll attract people when they see God is good. Now, how do they know God is good? Because we're his representatives and we do good things for others. Amen. We need to do something for others, not always have things done for ourselves, but we need to live and do good things for other people. Uh, sometimes they don't recognize it's good either. But we need to do good things for others. Then they'll recognize that it's because of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives that we're helping them and we're praying for them and we're doing good things for them. That is a great, great testimony to do those good things. Number three, number three is the fear of God also draws men. The fear of God. Proverbs chapter one, 
verse 7. You know, people respect a kind of fear. When they know someone is more powerful than they are, when they know somebody is, is better than they are, there, there's a certain respect there, and there's even a fear there. People are drawn to those who are better than they are. They are drawn to those who are greater than they are. And Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but then fools despise the wisdom and instruction. Now, the fear of the Lord is just the beginning. The Bible says we need to go on in love after that. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, the Bible says. But we need to go beyond fear. But fear is where it starts a lot of times. When you realize how great God is and what he really can do to us if we don't obey him and don't look to him. But then after that, we need to grow in love for him too. But fear is a beginning. Uh, there's certain individuals you might fear. There's certain individuals you might be intimidated by. And that's, that's interesting because it kind of attracts you to the person that is stronger than you. And you're attracted sometimes to someone that's better than you. And you look to them and, and they're your leader because they are better and they are stronger. So the fear of the Lord is another thing that attracts people. And then another thing I think that attracts people is creation itself creation. Since we're in Proverbs, just turn back to Psalm chapter 19. And I think it's kind of interesting that the Bible says here that God's creation talks. Creation says things. Psalm chapter 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare, that's the word speaking, the glory of God. And the firmament, meaning the earth itself, showeth his handiwork the way God works. And then we see that creation also talks in verse 2. A talking creation. It says in verse 2, day unto day uttereth speech. Every day that goes by is trying to tell you something. And night unto night showeth knowledge. And it says, there's no speech, nor language, nor people, nor anything else where their voice is not heard. This is universal. Everybody knows about God. The voice is heard everywhere. Uh, creation talks. This world talks. The firmament here. How huge the heavens are and everything. Every once in a while I'll see something where they talk about how, how, how large this universe is. And I'm always amazed. In fact, it's so large, they have to deal in what they call light years. Light years to try to explain how far away a star is or another solar system. They talk about thousands of light years. Now, in a light year, it's made up of what? Seconds? Thank you. I was, I wa I was wondering if somebody knew that because I didn't. Okay, 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. And work that up to the minute, 60 seconds in a minute, right? 60 minutes in an hour. 24 hours in the day, seven days in the week, uh, 12 months in a year. And we're talking about a year, a light year. I'll multiply that. Seconds. How many seconds are in a year? I don't know. But multiply that times 1,186,000 1, miles per. That's big. <laughs> I better stop right here. My mind's not clicking today. That is a lot of space. And that's some of the nearest one they measure in millions of light years. That astounds me. Our God is that great. He created that unbelievably huge a universe. He just spoke it into existence. I cannot fathom that. And yet that's the God of this book right here. And that God loves us. Amen. I could just stop right there, couldn't I? What a thought. What a thought. He's that great. That draws my uh, attention. That draws my thoughts. I think, look at this God, how great he is. And yet he came to this planet of all these multiplied billions and billions and billions of billions times stars there are and planets and so forth in this universe. And he, that God that created it all, came to this planet. He took the form of mankind and he died on Calvary's cross for us. Amen. Isn't that something? Wow. Creation, that attracts me. That, that draws me when I see those things. That's our God, friends. That's the one that we serve. That's the one we love. That's the one we've submitted to and obeyed because he loves us. And Calvary proves that. He's so big. 
beyond what we can imagine. That's attractive to other people too, not just Christians when you think about it. When you think about it. Another thing that attracts people is the righteousness of God. People understand morality. Now, they don't all practice it. No one does. We're all sinners. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. None of us are, are perfect. That's true. But morality attracts people. When they see someone that's living a moral life, although some criticize it because it makes them feel guilty, if they're not living the same moral life, and that's one of the criticisms we have as Christians, is that you Christians, you think you're better than me because you don't do this and you don't do that, and you don't go out drinking and you don't go do this and you don't do that. Uh, no, 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 we, we don't think we're better than you at all. We just know that we're a safe sinner. You might be a lost sinner yet, but we're a safe sinner, but we're all sinners. But when I see the morality of God in the Bible, in fact, this book right here has a higher standard of morality than any of the other so-called holy books. This has a high moral standard. It's, in fact, it's so high, nobody can meet it. That's strange. Nobody can meet up to this morality. Uh, the Islam, the Mohammedans, the worshipers of Allah, they have to bribe their people with immorality, with sensual things, to get them to serve and to maybe give their lives even. What kind of God is that? Not this Bible. This Bible is a moral book. And when people see the, the morality and the high standard of morality, that attracts. Now, again, it, it causes some to criticize because they know they're not meeting that standard and they never could. And that's all right. That's convicting. But what I'm saying is a lot of people, when they see the morality of the Bible and they see Christians living this morality in the Bible here, that does attract them. They say, hey, you're different. That's why it bugs me when I see Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses doing their block work, their street work, and they look better, sharper than people claiming to be Christians. They look more moral. They look more clean cut than Christians. And that bugs me because I think Christians ought to set the highest standard. We ought to look at least as good as those Mormons doing block work and going house to house visitation. And we ought to look just as, at least as good as Jehovah Witnesses. I don't think you ought to carry the little briefcases. I think that looks a little silly. But I don't carry briefcases when I do block work. But, but you ought to look sharp like the Jehovah Witnesses. You ought to look sharp like those Mormons. And I'm kind of jealous of them, to be honest with you. That Christians, claim, people claiming to be Christians, don't live that kind of standard. They don't look as sharp as those people do. Because our example, our example is important and it will draw people. When they find we don't live that kind of life. Oh, we don't live an immoral life. We don't live uh, those kind of lifestyle. We have a high level of morality. Our God is the highest, sets the highest standard. He is absolutely holy in his character. And we as Christians are striving for that. And that's what we desire. We want to be holy too. We want to be like God in our lives so we can honor him with our example. You know what attracts people to the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons and some of those cults? Because they don't believe in Jesus Christ being God. That's one of the main differences there. Uh, you know what attracts them? Their outward appearance somewhat. They see the morality. They see their good families. They, they've got a good family life. Many of them do. That attracts they think, I want that. That's what I want for my life. That's why we need to do this as Christians too. So the righteousness of God, the morality of God here. And then also another thing that attracts people is the truth of God. Uh, sometimes I'll say that I am right. When I read the Bible, I preach the Bible and teach the Bible. And what the Bible says, I am always right. Now, in my own personal life, sometimes I'll make some wrong decisions. I'm not always right in everything I do. I'm always right, though, except when I'm wrong. But I'm always right when I'm not wrong. But when I'm preaching this Bible right, I am right. Amen? And when you're preaching this Bible right, you are right. And does, don't you like being right? I like being right. It beats being wrong. Amen? I like being right. I don't want to be wrong. And I enjoy it. I enjoy picking up this Bible and knowing that this is the Word of God. This is absolute truth right here. Inspired in the, here we go. You ready? Inspired in the originals, preserved over the centuries in the King James Bible, the Bible we use here in our church. This is the perfect Word of God right here. I like that. 
And I'll debate anybody knowing that I've got truth on my side. And if you don't agree with me when I agree with the Bible, you are wrong. And I will not be shy about telling you, you're wrong, I'm right. That's the way it is. End of argument. That's it. Now, why? People respect truth. They respect people that can take a stand for something, explain why they believe it. That attracts people because most people don't know what's going on. Most people don't. And so we see that here, the Bible intrigues people. Now, I know that some have learned the Bible and they've gone after they've learned it, they've turned from the truth and that's, that, that's dangerous spiritually. I know that. But I also know that many are intrigued by this Bible. You know, one of the old stories I, I tell sometimes when I worked at the railroad downtown there in the Terminal Tower building, I became a Christian when I was in the service, as you know. Then I went back to work there a short while, about a year or so after I got out. But I thought, how can I be a testimony to people at, this, at the railroad where I work? I worked in one of the offices, one of the floors higher up there, 38th floor and 40 and 41 different times. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll just bring my Bible to work, and I'll have it just sitting there on my desk. And I had my Bible there, and I, but it, it was usually up in the upper left-hand corner, so they could... And somebody walk in the office, they see that, and they take two, at least two steps back. Some took three and four and even left the office, even left the room. It was so bad. Why? Because there's just something about this book. This is absolute truth right here. And people respect this book. Now, some respect it so much, they hate it. Because they know what it says, and they hate it. They don't want to read this book. Because this book is God's standard right here. But people, many people, will have a respect for the Bible, the Word of God. Even if it's no more than when they see when they back off two or three steps. But it's the Word of God. And we take a stand for the Word of God in our church. Take a stand for the Word of God in your life, too. Witness to people about it. Be able to show them a verse or two. Now, again, you need that's your personal witnessing. And there's different ways to do that. You need to be effective in your evangelism. And there's actions you can do that'll attract people. There's actions you can do that drive people away from you spiritually. You want to do what's right there. You pray about that. Ask for the Lord's wisdom. But this is the truth right here. It's so interesting, the close parallel between the Word of God that was personalized in Jesus Christ. He was the living Word. This is the written Word. And the parallels... Many people rejected him. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. Many people reject the Bible. Don't want to hear what it has to say. The parallels are amazing and really interesting about that. But the truth of the word, truth of God, that will attract people. The Bible intrigues men. What is it all about? I remember that's what intrigued me. That's what got me started reading the word of God, the Bible, after I was in the army there and someone was talking about the Bible. And they said, well, that's God's book. It's been inspired and, and God preserved his word over the centuries. And you can still believe it today. It's still perfect as when it was first written. That intrigued me. I started reading it. You know what? I got saved. I read it. I came under conviction that I was a sinner, that I really was not a believer in Christ. And I called out to him in salvation because of this book right here, the word of God. Wow. What a book. You see, these are some of the qualities that attract people. We want to try to win people. We want to try to reach them for the Lord. Then also we can see the power of God. We can see the prophecy of God. The future, that God knows the future. And the book of Revelation talks about that. When you tell people today, you know, as, as bad as some people think it is now, it's not going to get better. I wish I could give you some good news that things are going to improve. Some are trying to say that, but it's not going to get better. We know we're heading into the last days. Well, we are in the last days. I believe we're pretty much in the last days of the last days right now. But you need to understand things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse. But the Bible says the end result is a good thing, though, for those who are ready. And there's no one here tonight that does not have to be not ready. You can be ready tonight. Just because people are drawn, sometimes they're drawn to you when they see the love of God. They have questions for you. The goodness of God, the fear of God, the creation of God, this whole natural thing in which we live today. Uh, the righteousness of God, the morality of God, the truth of God, the power of God. Because they're drawn, though, does not necessarily mean they're saved. 
They still need the Lord Jesus Christ. They're drawn to him. They're drawn to truth. And like we started tonight, John chapter 12, verse 32, if I be lifted up, that referred to the cross specifically, but I believe also we need to track people to Jesus Christ himself. And we do that through these qualities. Not only should we reflect these qualities, most of them we can, many of them we can, but the qualities of God will attract people. But that's not salvation. There were many who were drawn to the Lord, but then when they heard his doctrine and his teaching and other things and realized what the effects of that would be, some of those effects not good, they walked away. I wish I could say the right words, the perfect words, or no one would ever walk away. I wish I could say that. I don't have those words. You're just going to have to believe it, that this is God's word right here. And he does care about you, but you have your free choice. You can be drawn to him for a while, and then if you leave, I just hope you don't. Where do you stand? Are you saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? You've been drawn to his people. You've been drawn to this church. You say, hey, this is a great church. People are friendly here. They seem to like me. I like coming here. I like the music. I even like Pastor Angie's preaching. I, I like the things in church here, but it's more than that. It's Jesus Christ. You need the Lord. You need the Lord. Where are you tonight? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the thoughts. As we consider these things that draw men, that attract men, that intrigue men, your word, your character, and the creation, this world. Why are we here? Why do we exist? What's life all about? And God, you have the answers. You are the source of all good things. Every good gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. All good things are from you. And I pray if there's someone here tonight, or maybe several here tonight, that don't believe that, that they believe sin and the world and the things in this world can make him happier than you can. Lord, help them to understand they believed a lie. That true joy and happiness is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. So please bless the invitation now as we sing the song. And I pray that people might come forward to pray about things or even pray for themselves. Or maybe even somebody coming forward to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please use this important, special time. Work on hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.